Hey friend, Josh here. Before we get started, I just want to let you know, due to some technical difficulties, we had a portion of the sermon malfunction this past Sunday. We decided instead of just leaving it out to splice in an audio fill into that portion that is missing, you will definitely hear it, but we want to encourage you to try and press through and, and try to flow as much as you can so that you can retain um, the intention and the direction of the sermon. But we pray that it's a blessing to you. Either way, uh, have a great week, and we'll see you on Sunday. As we do most Sundays, what I want to do is take a second to start with a bit of a story to set our mind kind of in the direction that we want to go. This one's a story that a lot of y'all have heard because it's a story about me. In 2010, on a random weekday afternoon, on a date that I can no longer remember, I walked into an empty and noiseless church. Uh, in contrast to all of the sermons and singing and all the stuff that we usually hear in church on Sundays, I, I got to say that even the quiet of it was quite eerie. I was a young man that was particularly filled with a lot of hopelessness, a lack of purpose, uh, uh, an insecurity, and a sense of shame. I was a heavy drug user, a regular drinker, an overall immoral man on many fronts. And in about 30 minutes of snot-nosed crying on that day, God transformed my life. Every day since then, for the past 14 years, I have been on a journey, sometimes an uphill journey, of becoming the man that I became that day. And I want you to hear what I'm saying. That for 14 years, I have been on a journey. Sometimes it has been a hard journey. Sometimes it has felt like an uphill battle to become the man that I became that day. That day, God made me his. He made me holy. That day, God made me perfect in his eyes, and he made me his son. And he changed my habits powerfully. From that day forward, I didn't use drugs anymore. I've, I've not been a drunkard. My life has changed. I looked at women differently. I became a distinctly moral, much more moral man than I was that day when, when that took place. But here's the thing. Through the course of the last 14 years, I've absolutely still struggled in areas like self-control. I've absolutely still struggled in areas like self-discipline in gentleness, in kindness, in peace. There were and still are areas that I'm growing in, areas where, again, I'm becoming who I became that day. I am perfectly and wholly and entirely God's. I am in love with Jesus. I am reminded often of the depths of Jesus' love for me in moments where I hear you speak it and where I see it from the words of Scripture. But I am still becoming the man that God made me then to this day and will be until I see him face to face, either at his return or when I die. And here's the thing, friend, our relationship with God is actually funny like that. It invites us to a vision of what he's done and what he's going to do, and then invites us on this journey that feels like a fever dream, like a Marvel character transporting from one reality to another, back and forth and into a third and into an eighth, all with this vivid kind of visceral thing going on in front of us where we see ourselves as, as immoral one day with aspirations to become something different, and it feels like all of a sudden we look up and, and we are different, and then we struggle. And then we get back up on the horse and then we keep going and then there's a breakthrough in our in, in how we live and God's clearly doing something wonderful but that's the nature of grace that's the very nature of grace it wouldn't be required unless we needed it and that very experience is what makes the presence of God so beautiful that he's with us when we need him even when we don't deserve him I didn't mean to get this emotional this early on. Lord, help me. All right. Today, we're continuing our sermon series in Isaiah, and we're going to consider what it looks like when God's people fail to become who he's made them. 
would they fail to become who they became when he called them? And how a loving God responds to us in that moment. Let's go, dude. That's all right. You know what? There was something there that was actually about God. I'd rather that be the case, if I'm being honest. Anything else? Um, so let's go ahead and get started by reading our verse. And if you want to read it with us, you're welcome to. But I am going to invite you to stand with us out of respect for God's word, these words that we believe were given to us by God. And so we're going to read it right now. And if you would stand with us, at the end of that time, I'm going to say this is the word of the Lord. I invite you to respond with thanks be to God. But today we're going to be reading Isaiah 2, 5 through 9. And if you want to read along with me, it's going to be on the screen. But it reads like this. House of Jacob, come and let's walk in the Lord's light. For you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of divination from the east and of fortune tellers like the Philistines. They are in league with foreigners. Their land is full of silver, and there is no limit to their treasures. Their land is full of horses, and there is no limit to their chariot. Their land is full of worthless idols. They worship the work of their hand, what, is, what their fingers have made. So humanity is brought low, and each person is humbled. Do not forgive them. This is the word of the Lord. You can have a seat. In chapter 2 of Isaiah here, Isaiah continues to point out the deep failures of the Hebrew people, both tribes. In short, he declares that God has abandoned the Israelites. And you might be asking, you, you might be asking yourself, why? Well, here's the thing. It's less that God has abandoned his people calling out for his help like a mother leaving behind a crying baby who's aching and longing for her. That's not the picture that's meant to be given here. Isaiah declares God is abandoning them because the Israelites have first abandoned him. First, they have turned their back on God and been filled themselves with the wisdom and beliefs of the world and the cultures around them. And it has shaped them, shaped them to the point that they are unrecognizable as his own. They are unrecognizable as his people. And here's what we need to understand. God is not abandoning as a selfish, petty, or petulant parent or partner. Rather, this is a mournful giving over of the Israelites to the consequences of their own actions. And an angry prophet in Isaiah declaring that sorrowful reality to his people. That's what's going on here. That's what's happening in these first words of verse 5 and verse 6. And so that's where we actually... Once we understand that, that's where we can pick up in verse 6 and understand it well. God, you have abandoned your people. Why? Why? Because they are, one, full of divination. This is a religious and spiritual practice forbidden among God's people from the east. And fortune tellers, another forbidden practice among God's people from the Philistines. And an important note should come up right here, actually. The Philistines live southwest of the Israelites, not east. In other words, they're filled with forbidden practices from the East and the West, from the influences of the cultures and the worlds all around them. And they have, and this has consequently uh, made it to where they are now in league with foreigners. This word in league in verse six, they're in league with foreigners. This original phrase actually means that they, literally means they had clasped hands with foreigners or clapped hands. It's a phrase used in Nehemiah to indicate worship. And this influence has impacted them in three ways, in their values, their security, and their worship. And so verse seven begins, their land is full of silver and there is no limit to their treasures. Their land is full of horses and there is no limit to their chariots. Their land is full of worthless idols. They worship the work of their hands, what their fingers have made. In this verse, silver and gold is an indictment on what they now find value in. In contrast to the generous and humble disposition God's people are meant to have, they now find their highest value in money. They have no limit to their riches. They're no limit soldiers. That's a rap reference for you. This isn't saying it's a sin to have money, though. God regularly blessed the Israelites, his people, the Hebrews, with riches in the kingdom. This isn't saying that it's a sin to have money, but rather that their highest value is now money, and that, that's the indictment. And this actually leads straight into the horses. 
He continues, their land is full of horses. They have no end to their chariots, right? The horses are an indictment on their security. They invest in war because the promise of their own strength is now greater than the promise of God's power. Long forgotten are the days when a giant was destroyed and killed by a boy, an army conquered by a fledgling group of 300, or the walls of Jericho coming down by a march. Their strength is now in their own might, not the mighty one. And idols are an indictment of their worship. They worship idols. This Hebrew word for idols here is the word elilhim. It, it's a word play off of the Hebrew word for God, Elohim. They worship things that act and say they're gods. They try to act like God, but they're not like God. They're not him. They're just cheap imitations of him. This is the indictment of the Lord. You have turned your back on me, been filled with the influence of the world and the cultures around you, and it has corrupted you to the point that you are unrecognizable as mine. Here's what he's not saying, though. And I want to make this clear. He's not indicting learning. He's not indicting them because they learned about other cultures. Faith does not require you to be ignorant as though God's people are meant to be dumb. There's this worldview that, that this kind of perception in the world around us that faith requires us to be ignorant. And it doesn't, friend. In the New Testament, God used a traveling Pharisee who was educated in the philosophies of the Greek and Roman world who could articulate their beliefs better than they could to change the landscape of the ancient world with the message of Jesus. Talking about Paul, by the way, God doesn't want you ignorant, friend. He's not indicting learning. What is he indicting then? Well, he's indicting this belief that that you can get an ear full of culture without an anchor full of God, and it's not going to influence you one bit. It's not going to shape you one bit. Friend, you can't get an ear full of culture without an anchor full of God, and it not influence and shape you, friends. If you're not anchored in the truths of who God is, what he's done, why he's done it, his values, his vision, his purpose, and you're constantly bombarded with the values, beliefs, purposes, visions of the culture around you, you're absolutely going to be become more like the cultures around you. And the culture may have some things right, but they likely have more wrong than they have right. Friend, if you're not anchored in God, and the truth of who he is, the truth of his generosity to you and his security for you. And yet you're constantly at work hearing about how important money is, being, being filled with the fear of life, of, the, of without money, without the security of money. And hearing how important it is, how prom promotions are, you're going to abandon the value of generosity and sacrifice for the false security of greed. It's a 100% chance. If you're constantly consuming media that tells you you need a spouse or a partner to be fulfilled and that marriage is meant to be a fantasy whirlwind of pleasure and your heart's not anchored in the truth that you are Christ's bride, that you already have your eternal partner and that marriage is a sacrificial commitment of submission and sacrifice for both husband and wife, a mutual submission in caring for one another, you're going to be one desperate to find someone and two disappointed once you get them. And friend, if you're not anchored in the truth that Jesus is the only one that can save this world, that he is the Messiah our hearts long for, that he is the Messiah that this world needs and you're bombarded by the political agendas of today, the political propaganda machine, that tells you that the other person is the worst possible thing for the world and the only hope that the world has is your candidate and that it's going to be apocalypse if the other person wins, the culture will tell you that your Messiah's name is Trump or Harris instead of Jesus. If you're not anchored in the truth of who God is, you'll be swept up in that in, in a moment. Friend, you can't get an earful of culture without an anchor full of Jesus, friend. It will shape you. Some of you have heard this story before, but, but it was a young man that I knew in college who 
had a really challenging interaction with these cults, with a particular cult, while he was at something called Passion Conference. Some of y'all might know what Passion Conference is. What happened was that he left the hotel that he was at in order to go to the arena that the event was being held at. And on the way, he saw someone holding a sign that, that, that just said, and I want to put this you know, generously and sensitively, do you still watch graphic material online? And as soon as he saw it, he was struck. He was struck with conviction. And so he stopped by and he said, yeah, what, what do y'all have to say? They responded back to him and started filling his mind with lies. They said, well, if, if you believe the true gospel, that wouldn't be an issue for you anymore. If you believe the truth, if you were actually saved, but you're not. If you had the truth, though, you would be free from that kind of thing. And here's what happened. They didn't just let him go on their way. They exchanged information. You see, had their statement been true, they would have been able to just set that truth there and let the truth do what it does. It was Augustine who was credited for saying that all truth is God's truth. And if what they said was true, it would have begun to work on the heart of that young man. But they knew that what they were saying wasn't true. Because what happened the next day is that starting from the moment that he gave them their information, they started bombarding him, bombarding him with messages. You need to be here. You need to come. You're not safe. You're not saved. He hasn't loved you. You're rejected. You're outside of the will of God. You need to come. You need to come. And they wore him down to the point that by the time they got to two or three days later, he had a bag packed and he was ready to go. And it was only by God's grace and an intervention by the community of God around him that that young man didn't make a horrible decision. Friend, you can't get an ear full of culture without an anchor full of Jesus. It's going to shape you. It's going to change you. And it's for that very reason that God indicts. God calls out. He points out, hey, that's wrong. That's incorrect. That's not right. And here's the thing. The moment that happens, the moment God looks at us and goes, that's not okay, our heart for many of us, it fills with fear or anger, fills with rejection, with insecurity. Why? Why? Because so many of us assume God's response to us being wrong to us failing is to punish us. That's the very next fear we have. We've done something wrong. We failed in some way. God is going to punish us. And here's the thing. For a lot of us, we experience punishment as disciplined divorce from love. For a lot of us, punishment is disciplined divorce from love. We don't feel cared for. We feel cast out. We feel far from God. We feel filled with fear. We feel vulnerable with no safety net, as though someone has ripped us naked and thrown us out into the very eye of the public. We feel hurt. We feel like there's no safety in it. And here's the thing, friend, that's just not true of God's character. That is a lie from the enemy in your life, because that's just not true of him. God is love. How could his actions be divorced from what he himself is? It's not in his character to treat you like that. It's not in his actions to treat you like that because it's just not him. God doesn't punish, but here's the thing. God may not punish. He may not discipline divorce from love, but he does correct. He does correct. I like to think of correction of this idea of punishment, that if punishment is disciplined divorce from love, then discipline, I mean, then, then correction is discipline fueled by love. Correction is discipline fueled by love. In correction, he doesn't cast us out. He draws us near. He cares for us by wrapping us in grace that may feel strong or severe in a moment, but is meant to produce beauty in the long run. It reminds me of a quote from a book that many of you are reading in your Cultivate group right now. It's called Gentle and Lowly by a man named Dane Ortland, and he writes this in, uh, in one of the chapters. He says, the Bible clearly teaches us that our sins draw forth the discipline of Christ. He would not truly love us if that were not true. But even this is a reflection of his great heart for us. 
When a body part has been injured, it requires the pain and labor of physical therapy. But that physical therapy is not punitive. It's not punishment. It is intended to bring healing. It's out of care for that limb that the physical therapy is assigned. Friends, we, uh, we have to understand God's actions in light of his holiness. Last week, we talked about his holiness when we started this discussion in Isaiah. We said that in Isaiah, Isaiah defines holiness in three ways. One, that God transcends us. And because he transcends us, he, because he stands above us, he's worthy to judge us. He is. He's right in his indictment. He's worthy in his judgment. But it is out of that worthiness to judge that comes his freedom to forgive. The guilty party never walks up and says, I'm forgiven. You should forgive me. Every time something like that happens, we feel it unjust. We feel the compulsion of someone who's guilty come and say, you're going to forgive me or else. No one looks and goes, that's just. That's beautiful. Everyone goes, that's rotten. That's unjust. Only the victim has the freedom to forgive. They're the only one endowed with that ability. And it's from God's worthiness and correct judgment of us that comes his freedom to look at us and go, you're forgiven. The aim of God's actions as a result, the aim of his action is always to redeem and restore. Write that down. That the aim of God's action is always to redeem and to restore. His desire is to one, redeem you. That is to save you. He desires to rescue you. He desires to make you his son or his daughter, to make you his forever. He desires to redeem you. But he also desires to restore you. That is to bless you. He desires to give you purpose and vision for your life, to use you to bless others and to bless yourself and the generations that come after you. Hear me, friend. God redeems, he saves regardless of your actions. That's the first thing we have to understand. That God redeems, he saves you regardless of you. There's a thief hanging up next to him, up on the cross, who's done absolutely nothing for God. And yet simple faith to say, this man is righteous. Jesus responds to it by saying, today you'll be with me in paradise. Redemption, salvation, you becoming his son or his daughter has nothing to do with you. We talked about this when we talked about the Ten Commandments last year. That the Ten Commandments don't come before God saves, they come after he saves. God doesn't give rules and then use those rules to gauge whether he saves. He saves and then he provides rules. He will redeem you regardless of what you do. But here's the facts, friend. God cannot, I think better yet, God will not restore what's unchanged. He will redeem you and save you without you changing. He will truly make you his own. But God is not going to bless, bring increase. God's not going to do those things in your life if nothing has changed. Primarily because if he did that in your unrepentant just form, where you're not trying to make changes in your life at all, God's not actually blessing you with more beauty. He's blessing you with more sin. Because all he's going to do in blessing you as you're unrepentant and as you're not trying to change is just multiply the evil that you're creating in your life or in the life of others. God is not going to restore, bless, create, do beautiful things in the life of someone who's not repentant. Friend, if we want to see sin cycles broken in our life, if we want to see generational change take place in our life, if we want to see beauty come into our communities and our families and the things that we actually want to see beauty and life take root in in our world, it's not going to be us going, well, Jesus is going to forgive me. It's going to be you taking the responsibility of your life onto yourself, leaning on the grace of God and desiring to make some real changes. This is why these indictments are here. They're not final judgments on the people of Israel to say, now you know what you did wrong. I hope I never see you again. The indictments exist for the purpose of restoration. He judges for the purpose of restoration. He corrects for the purpose of restoration. He's present for the purpose of restoration. Don't fear God looking at you and going, that was wrong. It's the very hand of his judgment there that's evidence of his love and desire to restore you. It's in his affection and correction, bars that actually comes his work in your life, friend. 
The late great philosopher and theologian Dallas Willard once said, the gospel isn't allergic to effort, the gospel is allergic to earning. The gospel message of Jesus does not tell you you have to earn your place. That was won by a man hanging on a cross for you in your stead. The gospel message never wants you to earn because earning's already been done by him, by Jesus. The gospel never wants you to earn, but the gospel does deeply desire for you to put in some effort. The gospel message does invite you to take up your cross and to follow. The gospel message does ask you to deny yourself and to set your attention and affection on Jesus. It does ask you to follow the mature and the godly among you as they follow the Lord. It does ask you to die to yourself. It does ask you to put in some work. It absolutely asks you that, friend. If you think that Christianity is a get out of jail free card to the fullness of everything that's going on in your life, you were wrong, friend. It's not that. We just read a verse wherein God delivers over to the consequences of their actions, his own people. The consequences of your world, the practical consequences of your actions are still gonna come for you. But the deep longing of God's heart is that through his correction and your response, he would set you on a better and more beautiful path wherein the, the consequences of your action are not hurtful, but rather blessings to you and to others. That's what correction's for. That's what God's judgments are for. That's how he works. So if you're running from, from his correction, if you're running from his indictments, if you're running from him going, hey, that's not right, friend, friend you are putting yourself vulnerable. And likewise, if you hear them and reject them and turn away from them, you're likewise leaving yourself vulnerable. God invites us in these judgments, come, respond, turn away. You've turned from me before, but I, I'm, I'm inviting and correcting. In my correction, I'm inviting you to turn now from those things and turn to me for the sake of you. Not for the sake of me, for the sake of you, for your sake. And at this point, I'm hoping, I'm hoping by God's grace on your life, by God's grace in your mind and in your heart, that you are asking, how though? Because God, I want to. I would love to change. But how? Friend, I, I think there's a multitude of ways that we do that. A good way to get a good start, and this is, a, this is you know what, yeah, this is a, I don't have any reason to be embarrassed to plug this particular idea. There is a whole cultivate track called changing, right? Spiritual growth, where we read a book entitled, You Can Change. So go do that if you wanna get some first steps. But, but here, here's what I do wanna say is that I think the first step in that change that you're longing for is this. Friend, change comes when we learn that restoration comes after redemption. Change comes when we learn that restoration comes after redemption. What do I mean? Here's the thing, friend, if you're scared to take a step forward because you think every misstep gets you back to step one, you're gonna be in the same spot over and over and over, forever and ever and ever because you're gonna be so scared to take a step forward that you can't actually take a step at all. Because missteps feel like the end of the world for you. But if you realize that you are his, that, that restoration, your growth doesn't come first. It comes after you're his. None of my kids took a step before they were mine. Not a single one of them did anything to earn any affection, to earn a single bit of approval, to earn a single bit of my love for them before they were born. But they were born into that love. If you can grasp that idea, that redemption, you being saved, you being his comes first, then friend, you'll realize that every misstep is still a step toward the Father. 
and you'll start taking some steps. Even missteps are steps toward the Father at that point. Even missteps will be steps where he comes in and by his grace, he picks you up and keeps you moving. Even missteps will be steps to the Father. If you can realize that your restoration, your growth, his blessings, they come after he's redeemed you, after he saved you, after you're his, after he's made you his son, his daughter, all that comes afterwards. You are free to fail forward, friend. You are free to fail forward. The question here today, the question that the whole of Isaiah is going to ask is not whether you're going to respond because everything is hinging on it. it. It's that are you going to respond so that you can rejoin me? The very first verse in this text says, come, oh Israel, let us walk in the Lord's light. Not, oh come, oh Israel, you have lost the Lord's light but the very correction itself is rooted in an invitation to come and to enjoy him. Remember him, come again and follow him. In the film, The King, I don't know if any of y'all watched this. Uh, I don't have very many streaming platforms outside of Netflix. So I'll be dogging that Netflix content, I ain't gonna lie. So I got some Netflix bangers in my back pocket if you ever need them, just saying. But in the 2019 film, The King, uh, starring the illustrious Timothy Chalamet, or Chalamet, however you say it. I call, you say Chalamet, so that's all right. He plays uh, Henry V, and in this fictitious retelling, of Henry V's adolescence, Henry V is depicted as a young man who's given himself over to bars and brothels. That the majority of his young adult life is, is given into this place of wasting it away. And here's the thing though, during the entirety of his wasting his life away, he never ceases to be the king's son. He never ceases to be the prince that he was born into. He's wasting his life in bars and brothels, waking up in the middle of the afternoon, not a care in the world regarding the kingdom and the responsibilities that are in front of him. And in the midst of all that, he's still the prince. Until one day he's called into the, to the royal courts and informed your father is gonna pass away. And you will not be overlooked. The boy in the bars and the brothels is going to be king. And in the movie, he internally makes it a deep and difficult choice that he is going to turn away from the life that he once lived and he is going to walk into the calling that is his by birth to be the king. And in the next several years, he conquered France. A friend, I deeply believe that the Lord has incredible plans for you. I deeply believe that he wants to work in you and through you. I deeply believe that he sees you and that he knows you and that he has incredible plans to do beautiful things and to make beautiful things in your life. But out of grace and love for you, friend, he is not going to bless in order to just multiply sin in your life, in order to multiply corruption in your life. Respond to the correction of God in your life, not by going, okay, I'm scared, I'm insecure, I don't wanna hear that. It's all making me feel like kind of my life is, is all gonna go. No, respond in light of who you are. You are his. And you have been given a spirit by which every single one of your failed attempts in the hands of the spirit of God that has been given to you can be done more with in that failure than you could ever do with all your strength. You are free to fail forward, friend. Your response today is, not, is rooted completely in whether or not you're going to respond in light of the fact that Jesus has died for you, knows you, has made you his, that you were cared for and loved, you were not forsaken or, or cast out, that everything in your life has the safety and security of a grace that has always caught you and will always catch you because the man on the cross surrendered himself so that you could be found. If you are going to walk in that lightness, if you're going to walk in that beauty, if you're going to walk in that grace, I love you, friend. Don't do it half-hearted. Don't do it half-effort. You're worth more than that. He's worth more than that. Respond to the beauty of these corrections by going, let's go. 
full tilt. I will follow you to the T. I will sacrifice where you call me to sacrifice. I will obey where you call me to obey. When it is difficult and when culture presses in and is like, that's kind of weird, say, man, but he's kind of beautiful, so that's okay. And you keep on going. And in light of your, your, your efforts, your sacrifices, the beauty of God's grace and call in your life is that he will do more with that than you could have ever done on your own. Come, O Israel, and let us walk in the Lord's light. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the beauty of your word. Thank you for your correction, that it is not discipline divorced from love, but rather it's discipline fueled by love, that you see us, you love us. And like a parent who desperately desires to see their child raised right and sent into the world in wholeness, and in a beautiful trajectory, you likewise come alongside of us. You love us. You forgive us. You make us your own. And you never leave us. That your presence is with us, even when we don't deserve you to be with us. Help us, Father, to respond to your corrections with humility and with confidence in your promises and confidence in your grace. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.